Hello and welcome to the 2023 EduTalk series hosted by Biotone, Biotone Edu Partner Program and Massage Industry Experts. As massage schools, students and practicing therapists have met the challenges of the last few years, the EduTalk series hosted by Biotone continues to support virtual learning and building massage community by connecting you with industry experts who share their knowledge and expertise on topics, not only for class discussion, but career success. Today's expert is Paul Kohlmeyer, a massage therapist, educator, and practitioner of oriental medicine. He's a self-professed research nerd an avid supporter of understanding the research and adding the research found into his coursework. Additionally, Paul is busy with a mobile practice and is owner of Cupping Canada and Cupping USA, both supply and education companies. Let's listen and learn as Paul discusses Cupping, I don't know that Eastern and Western processes. Cupping is a centuries old. Cu cupping is centuries old and has been practiced in nearly every culture in the world. Because of this, there are many interpretations of how and why cupping works. Paul explores the ideas around cupping, sorting through the information, and cupping healthcare history, and providing understanding where this language leads. And with that, welcome, Paul. Thank you. Um, before I turn it over to Paul, everyone, thank you again for joining. Please be sure your sound is muted and your video is off. And please feel free to chat questions for Paul, which will be answered at the end of his presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. And Paul, I'll step out and turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Janelle. And thank you again for having me here to speak. Welcome, everyone. Good to see you. I'm going to share my presentation with you so that we can follow along. Please do ask questions in the chat, and we will um, try to answer them as we go, or at the end, we'll see where it goes. Um, and here we are. I think we were originally billed as East versus West, but I'm a little bit more inclusive than that. So it's today it's going to be cupping East and West. Um, a little bit about me before we start, because some of you may not know who I am. Um, I have been a massage therapist for 27 years. I am definitely a research nerd. I actually enjoy reading research articles. I don't like summaries. I like to actually go and read the article. Uh, and this picture is me in front of a poster series that we were presenting at the Massage Therapy Association of Manitoba um, a research symposium. Uh, I've been a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner for 15 years now. Um, I've actually used cupping for about 20 years. I started using it within my manual therapy practice first before I went to TCM school and uh, have been using it mainly actually in my in my uh, massage therapy practice. I actually very rarely use it in my uh, acupuncture practice. It's quite interesting. Um, I've been presenting and lecturing and educating people for 17 years. My preference is always uh, people like yourselves who are probably graduated from massage school who are working therapists. Um, I am not so great with uh, students, though I like teaching them. I kind of have the tendency to break them a little bit because I tend to be a little bit more advanced, I'd say, or a little bit more um, forward thinking than a lot of the school uh, schools are. So, And that's just because I read research. I don't wait for it to translate through textbooks to come to me. So, uh, and that just gives me a little bit of a different perspective. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk a little bit about cupping, what it is. Um, we're gonna do some comparison then. We're gonna talk about access to treatment. We're gonna talk about educational requirements. 
uh, the practice itself and how it may differ in the East versus in the West, and then what informs the practice, which I think is an important uh, understanding because if you understand all of those things you can understand why some of the wording is used the way it's used so uh, and then I'll summarize it all and then we'll go with some closing thoughts and all together that should uh, be done in a little under an hour and we can um, ask us some questions at the end uh, or if you have questions throughout please ask away now I'm going to say in this that um, I am trying to present to you some of the differences between traditional medicines and Western medicine as it relates to cupping. Um, I'm going to try and stay neutral. My preference, I guess, um, is that I like the idea of Western-based physiology. Um, and I think I like that mostly because my clients understand it from the get-go. As a Chinese medicine practitioner, I do value the Eastern philosophies, uh, but often when you communicate that to a uh, Western science trained uh, client, because you know you go through high school and ju junior high and all of that in Western physiology, learning biology, et cetera, et cetera, um, you are Western trained, and so. Um, when I try to communicate Chinese medicine ideas, there has to be a lot of preference because they don't understand off the hop that the organs that I'm talking about have different functions in Chinese medicine than they do in Western medicine. And so unless you're communicating that, you might be having a problem with communication with your client. And one of the biggest things that we don't want to do is break our client's idea of how their body works. So... I, while I value the traditional medicine quite a bit, when I communicate with my clients, I communicate almost exclusively in Western physiological terms. Uh, and that way there's a uh, more clarity in the communication. So that's where I stand at that. I will try and stay neutral in my language, but if I slept, that's where my preference, or if you want to call it a bias, that's where my bias is can't really be a bias. A bias is an unconscious uh, uh, um, preference. It's more preference than that because I realize that it, that is my preference. So what is cupping? Ultimately, what cupping is, is some way of using an object of some sort to apply suction or negative pressure, whichever version of those words you like, against the skin to create some sort of therapeutic effect effect. Now, that can be quite literally anything. I have seen cupping done with coffee cups. Uh, there was some videos going around of a Russian dude doing them with plungers, like with the stick on them, toilet plungers. Uh, you can use the traditional cups that we see uh, that are made of silicone or plastic that are in use mostly in the West, or the glass fire cups or ceramic fire cups that you see more associated with Eastern styles of practice. All of these things do exactly the same thing. Um, so cupping kind of puts them all together. All right. So um, now cupping isn't just one thing, however, like it's many different techniques. So you can apply cups and put them on a body and leave them. You can slide the cup over. The, the skin, you can put the cup on and take the cup off. There are many different things you can do with cups and including adding other therapies, which we see in some of the more traditional practices that we don't see a lot in the West. So you really, when you, you come across a person who's had cupping before, it really begs the question that you have to ask them is, well, what kind of cupping? Look, what was done? Because just having cupping done from two different people absolutely does not mean you're getting the same treatment. So um, there are people that do cups with acupuncture needles. There, they do e-stim across the cups. And that can be done both east and west. Laser therapy, bloodletting, um, all sorts of things. So cupping isn't just one thing. It's a very kind of complex um, inter, uh, group of interventions that we can apply to our, our clients. And depending on your point of view, you may 
apply different ones uh, based on that point of view and how you think the body works or how you think the physiology works. Okay, so that's cupping in a nutshell in a ver the very shortest version that I can give you without teaching you a four hour course. Um, so let's get into some of the differences. So history. Well, history is probably the same for both. In the East, um, cupping probably started in Africa and moved slowly through Asia and the um, Mediterranean with trade. Um, we know that it probably started in Egypt. Uh, there is mention of it around 3,500 years ago in a uh, medical papyrus written uh, and stored with, uh, with um, some of the mummies that were found and burial stuff that was found um, in the eight, uh, sorry 19th century. Um, so quite old. And in order to have been written down at that time, it was probably been in use quite some time before that as a medical uh, um, technique, because the uh, papyrus that it was written in, it was written as a medical uh, technique. So along with herbal medicines and all sorts of things. Uh, it's been in continual practice in Chinese culture for at least 1800 years, probably longer. Um, it's seen continual practice in the Middle East uh, in traditional medicine for at least 1600 years. Um, so and it's probably been practiced, again, in Egypt, at least 3500 years, and probably a long time before that as folk medicine or family medicine. So and probably in all of these places, um, it has been, uh, been practiced that long. So but if we were to think of where it started, probably in the in Egypt. Now in the West, uh, let's define the West a little bit. If we're talking about North America, it was probably bought, brought over by uh, colonists, okay? Uh, we do not see that it is indigenous to North America that we know of. We've never found any evidence uh, that I have seen anyway, that it was used pre-colonization. Um, if we're talking about uh, Europe though, we do, we've seen it for quite some time, at least 2000 years, because it is written uh, around 400 BC, it was written into the writings of Galen, Hippocrates, and the people that were writing in Greece about medicine. So we can see a historical usage uh, in Western medicine, if you think of uh, Hippocrates as the father of modern medicine is what he's often called, we can see that cupping has been used the entire time of the inception, if you want to use that as an inception of modern medicine. And so it's probably been used in medical circles, at least from the time of the Greek civilization's um, dominance in Europe. And throughout the, the area of Europe, uh, it probably progressed through um, cultural, cultural trade. Uh, and covered all of Europe from that point. So really history is quite similar, but it really is dependent upon which culture you're talking about. Um, it either started in it if you're African or probably was uh, brought in through trade in every other culture. So history, it's really old. <laughs> And that's really what we can come back to. The language of cupping today probably is influenced heavily by all the types of medicine it has gone through over the years and the way it's translated from one culture's language into another culture's language or between one person's uh, opinion of the pathophysiology of the body to another group's pathophysiology, okay? Because pathophysiology is different. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. Access to treatment, I think, is very interesting. So in the East, if we think about uh, practitioners in China and Taiwan, um, you can see cupping practiced within a hospital. Um, and that would be fairly common in traditional Chinese medicine hospitals, not so much in the Western medicine hospitals that exist in China. Pretty much exclusively in China, that's the only place where you'll see it practiced 
within the medicine um, that is being delivered at a hospital. Now, there are, of course, outpatient care that you can see it being, even in, in North America, you can see it uh, being done, but probably all over the world where cupping has, um, because of how I'm going to say fad like it is, it's exciting right now. So because of that, it's being um, used as experimental treatments in hospitals in the, in the West. But um, in the East, uh, you can see some usage of it small in hospitals outside of China. But mostly you're going to see it in outpatient care facilities, private businesses or homes where people or family members are using it on each other. Now we have no data for the number of practitioners doing it. And I was hoping to find some, but it is pretty ambiguous. Uh, so who do you include in this and who don't you include? So it was a little hard to get any solid numbers. I have actually abandoned the search for that. Uh, here in the West, um, generally speaking, is mostly practiced either in private businesses or in homes. Uh, again, there's no data on the number of practitioners who are practicing cupping, mostly because even practitioners don't define themselves by that. Most people who do cupping also do other things. So we don't define ourselves as just cupping therapists. So again, very hard to find numbers. Um, so access to treatment is kind of interesting in where you can access it. But for the most part, it's the same. Um, in terms of education, now there's a big difference at the highest levels in the East versus the West. Um, in the East, in China specifically, um, you're going to see physicians trained to do cupping, um, where we don't see that as much in the West. Now, on saying that, I personally know a few physicians who know how to do cupping, who have taken training on it but they didn't learn it in medical school. They learned it the same way that manual therapists do and usually in shorter courses or along with a Chinese medicine uh, degree or diploma or whatever, you, whatever they get in their jurisdiction. Um, so I'm going to say there's, it's more common in China to see physicians practicing, but it's definitely not exclusive. Uh, in both the East and West, we see manual therapists of all kinds using cupping. We see estheticians of all kinds using cupping. Uh, Non-healthcare workers are doing cupping. Family members are doing cupping on each other. So ed the education really isn't all that different either, other than the pathophysiology of it. So we can see both East and West. Now, in the East, the only other group that is interesting to me um, is a group in the Middle East who are doing cupping because in hijama, it is more often practiced with bloodletting. So it tends, again, to be physicians who do it because the piercing the dermis tends to be a protected act anyway. Uh, so being able to cut your patient and then put cups on to bleed them is something usually done by physicians as well. Though there are some non-healthcare workers that do do it, I'm sure, in the same way that there's non-healthcare workers that are doing cupping and massage therapy and manual therapy in the West. There's always outliers. And certainly family members can always do this stuff on each other. It's not a big deal, um, I don't think. Um, in terms of education, um, the education of the groups is obviously different. Physicians are obviously trained differently than manual therapists. Manual therapists of all kinds are trained differently. You, chiropractor versus physical therapist versus osteopath versus massage therapist. They're all trained a little bit differently. And then aestheticians are also trained differently. So the education to of how to do cupping within the the um, complex of your other diploma or certificate or certification is um, equal bearing to your certification. So uh, a chiropractor, um, they have higher liability than massage therapists. So they should be working harder 
uh, in their education. A physician has higher liability than both of them, so they should be working into more education for their uh, certification or their, their certificate in order to apply cupping within their practice. Uh, and as it goes down the line, you see shorter and shorter courses. So that's talking about education. Now, pathophysiology is where we find some huge differences. So in the East, I'm going to say that the pathophysiology is often based on traditional method, sorry, traditional medicines and their traditional belief systems. Um, and so what we see, and let's kind of go through a couple of them, the two that I kind of always bring up are going to be Chinese medicine and Middle Eastern medicine. So in Chinese medicine, the pathophysiology is going to use words like um, blood stasis, qi stagnation, um, the, um, the, the non-movement or stasis of blood, body fluids, and qi. They're going to talk possibly about the different organs or the channel system or meridian system, if you like to use that word better than channel. Um, so they're, the way they believe disease, and I say it's a belief because I think even Western medicine is a belief. Um, so the way they believe the body to work is really a way for people to figure out what treatment to give. So pathophysiology is the basis for a logical deduction to get you from the patient walks in with a disease to this is the treatment that will apply in order to help them live a better, healthier life. Okay, and that's the pathophysiology. So in Chinese medicine, you'd be looking at things like blood stasis, qi stagnation, um, how the organs are working, how the qi is flowing through the meridian or channel system. And you can make diagnosis or assessments based on that pathophysiology in order to come up with the best treatment. Best treatment often being a combination of herbal medicine, acupuncture, cupping, exercise therapy called qigong, uh, food and diet therapies, things like this. Um, if you look at the East in, especially in um, uh, the Middle East is you, where there is a strong Muslim um, group, uh, cultural group, uh, never mind which, which one we're talking about, but just as a group, the um, Prophet Muhammad, uh, he dictated in, in some of the writings that to, for your health, you were to do hijama, which is bloodletting with cupping. And so um, certain groups of Muslims or certain uh, adherents of the Muslim faith will do cupping every few months as a almost a purification ritual to uh, get themselves healthy or to keep themselves healthy, hopefully. Um, and this is one of the first times in medicine that we have someone um, saying that cupping can be used preventatively, which I think is very interesting. Um, so that in and of itself is a reason to use cupping, a very specific kind of cupping, but it's outside of I'm sick, therefore I'm going to get treated. So it's a little different than in some other styles of medicine. I think it's really quite an interesting thing. And it is, um, it is practiced as medicine. So I think it's important to understand that. Um, and you'll see physicians doing this type of treatment. Um, so uh, very important that, it, that it's clear that that's what's going on. Like that's one of the impetuses for getting treatment. Now there are other impetuses that I will talk about the removal of bad blood. Um, and that's translated from their language uh, in terms of their pathophysiology and how they believe the body works. And I think that's important because if you take it outside of Eastern medicine, that thought process doesn't make much sense. In the same way that if you take Chinese medicine, even the concepts of blood stasis or qi stagnation, 
chi stagnation doesn't even exist in Western medicine. And blood stasis is a wonky idea to try and drag over, um, even though um, you can see some of it represented in, in Western physiology. It's not one for one, right? So the problem becomes, if you are talking in this language, it's hard to Westernize it for a Western mi trained mind or Western trained physiology's uh, client to have uh, ease of consumption of the ideas that you're trying to get across. So I think that's very interesting. Now, recently, there have been overlays, and I mean recently, in, like in the past 50 to 70 years, there's been overlays of Western medicine and science into both Chinese medicine and Middle Eastern medicine, where they are trying to um, overlay some of the principles of Western physiology to describe what's happening within their um, more traditional medicine systems. And I think this is good because hopefully at some point we'll come to a common ground with what our language is. So we're talking the same language and we mean the same things when we say uh, certain um, disease patterns in pathophysiology, but it's not there yet. And it's starting to get actually fairly confusing because it sounds Western, but often the understanding isn't there on either side of what they're talking about. So while on the surface, it means the, the conversation is starting to happen, the undertone, once you read into it, the physiology doesn't make sense on either side. So that's kind of interesting. Now in the West, um, obviously cupping has still come out of traditional practice. Um, we still have practitioners of Chinese medicine training other groups to use it and the language sticks, right? Because that's the language they're teaching in. But there has been an impetus from especially from physical therapy, uh, even manual therapy, to use Western science physiology only um, and bring Western science to the forefront. So we're starting to see Western scientists take on the um, job of trying to prove what is happening in Western pathophysiology in cupping. It's not going quite going fast but we are st starting to see higher and higher quality studies come out, which is different from the studies that come out of Asia, which tend to be um, um, looking back at what they've already treated and trying to make some deductions. We're doing more of the randomized control trials where we're designing a trial at the beginning and then seeing what happens. So the pathophysiology is very different and, um, it's not necessarily easy to go from one to the other. Often we have to make a decision on which pathophysiology we're going to use and stick with that for better or for worse. Um, more on pathology. This slide is my nemesis. Uh, this slide goes around on social media. Please don't ever share this slide. It doesn't make sense. Um, Obviously, I've never really seen a patient with green skin, like the background of this. Uh, and this is probably because it's been shared and printed and shared and, uh, and uploaded and printed and uploaded and printed a few times. Um, I can't find where this came from originally. And I've looked, I've done a couple of Google searches for versions of this. And um, I'm not sure where it comes from. It obviously comes from a Chinese medicine source because it, they talk about blood and qi deficiency in here, which is Chinese medicine pathophysiology. Um, I would suggest that this isn't a great thing to um, pass along because it pathologizes the post-cupping mark, which I don't think is real. Um, probably something more like this is going to be more accurate where we see skin reactions to cupping um, throughout uh, in, in different styles, but no pathologizing about them, which I think is really important because honestly, they're a side effect. I don't ever go out to bruise my client or to mark my client. I'm going to try and change uh, something about their tissue 
and occasionally marks happen. So uh, I think that's quite interesting. So this was my first shot at redoing charts. I think they're interesting. Now in research, I did talk about this a little bit. In the East, generally speaking, you're going to think of cupping historically was done as trial and error. Well, we did all these treatments and with this group, it worked really well. So we're gonna only apply it on this group on, or people like them or have this disease. And that's really how the over eons, how the traditional Chinese pathophysiology was probably developed um, and how uh, treatments were tied to certain pathophysiology or certain pathologies. Um, and since the introduction of Western medicine, they usually do this retrospective research where they say, okay, on the last 600 people with lower back pain that we treated with cupping, we did this type of cupping on this percentage of them. We did this type of cupping on this percentage. And this group, the first group got, you know, 80% better. And the second group got 40% 40, 40 better. I'm just making numbers up. And so we're going to use this over, or we're going to recommend this over this, group one over group two, or treatment one over treatment two. And you see some of that retrospective style study, which is really good because it usually has huge numbers. They will, they will look at hundreds, if not thousands of cases. Whereas in the West, we tend to do randomized control trial, trials, which are prospective studies. They look, they design the study first and then put people in them, but they're expensive. So they only run a few people through them. Like a normal sample size is going to be 15 to 30 people, which while the results are good, it's not enough people to really generalize to a larger population. So I think it's really interesting that you have these two types of studies. And the interesting thing to me is both kinds of studies tend to show that cupping works. Um, and though one is got a huge numbers, it's not believed or taken as seriously because it's prospective versus, or it's re retrospective versus prospective, which has shorter, has smaller numbers but can be um, checked a little bit better for biases. So that's quite interesting to me. Um, in terms of language, uh, in research, certainly in the East, there is traditional language used, absolutely. Um, and you can, if you're reading a study, you know fairly quickly whether it's research done based on, China, uh, I'm gonna say Chinese medicine, but traditional medicines, whether it's in uh, the Middle East or in China or in Russia or wherever, or it's done in Western physiology. It's quite easy to see the difference. Now to summarize all of this up, I really don't think that cupping is very different East to West. Ultimately, education is fairly similar, though you get in Chinese medicine, you get, and, and uh, in the Middle East, you get physicians doing it. You still get some physicians in the West, but there are more physicians for sure doing it in the East. But outside of them, the education is fairly similar. Access to treatment, so access is the same places, probably a few more people in the East doing it than the West, but that's just because there are more people, right? Um, and then the history, of course, is all very similar. Um, it all probably comes out of Egypt, probably, or Africa somewhere. And so historically, it's all very similar. The only thing that's really different is the pathophysiology of it all. And that just leads to you to different styles of treatment that are inherent in how you're going to, um, I'm going to say prescribe a treatment, but how you're going to perform a treatment is probably the better uh, way to do it or the way to say about it. So the pathophysiology may lead you to, if you're trained more in Chinese medicine, you will 
tend towards Chinese medicine treatments, which are going to probably have some acupuncture with them. It's probably going to have some herbal medicine with them, moxibustion. Uh, in the newer styles, you'll see a little bit more electrical stimulation across uh, the cups. But all in all, you're going to stay with a Chinese medicine pathophysiology to do that. If you are seen by a Middle Eastern doctor who is trained in hijama, if you're going to get prescribed hijama or have hijama done with you, it is probably going to be bleeding cupping or bloodletting with cupping, where it just makes a little mark and then they put the cup on to draw blood out. Um, very normal. Uh, they do it in Chinese medicine as well. Um, it's very normal. Uh, it's not all that weird unless we think about it in, within our practice as manual therapists, where it starts to get a little weird because we're not comfortable. We don't, we aren't allowed in most cases to uh, cut the body or pierce the dermis. So again, it's a protected act here in the West more so. So we don't see it as much. Whereas in Western um, uh, medicine or Western culture, the use of cupping has come and gone a few times as fad treatment. Um, and I do call it a fad treatment by the amount that it is in the news. Um, we certainly saw it um, in the early eight, or sorry, early 90s and uh, into early 2000s with um, people on the red carpet. Uh, and if you do watch back uh, old, uh, old versions of uh, the Olympics, we've been seeing uh, cupping marks on people since at least 1984. That's the first time I remember it. It's mostly Chinese athletes that were having it done, um, but we've seen it on athletes the whole time. Um, though it wasn't until uh, the last couple of Olympics that we really have seen this big push with Michael Phelps winning all these gold medals with cupping marks on him that we really saw media pay attention to it. So I think it is a little bit of a fad in that it's getting a lot of media attention. I don't think that is a bad thing um, when it normalizes a treatment that has been, been done for at least 3,500 years in the human experience. So uh, I think that's really interesting. But as we go into the West, we are going to have this tendency to have it done in either of two ways with cups being put on and left in one spot or cups being put on and then moved across the body, either it's static cupping or you know cupping where the cup is left in one spot or massage cupping where the cup is moved around. Um, and it, either one is fine. They both work and they just may not work the same. Uh, but again, going that you, we have to ask what our patients ex or our clients experience of cupping is before we um, decide which one is going to work better for them. Because often people will have been cupped by someone else in a very specific situation and they'd like it or didn't like it. And if they didn't like it, well, how was it performed? So you could don't do the exact same thing, right? So I think this is interesting. I think in terms of research, I can always say we need more research. Research is very interesting to me. Um, there is always a need for more of it. I love research. Uh, I'd love to be reading much more cupping research. Um, but I think in the West, research tends to be a bit more stringent in that they try to um, eliminate or limit bias um, a little bit more than in, is done in the East. Uh, but the flip side of that is that subject numbers are going to be low because the, the, the um, research is going to be a bit more expensive. So just looking at that, um, I like research done by both the East and the West. I think it's important. Um, and then the application of cupping in the East has been done for so many millennia. Um, not so much in the West, though, really, if you're talking about in Greece, if you're including Europe in that, then it's really been done for millennia and there's really no, no difference, right? So I think that is um, where we got for our summary. Closing thought, um, 
cupping tends to get the results as, as advertised. And what I mean by that is cupping tends to, whenever you apply it, you tend to get a decrease in pain, a change in the perception of disability within the patient. You tend to increase the range of motion if there is a range of motion restriction. Um, and you tend to have a, uh, when they test for it, you'll get a decrease in creatine kinase expression, which might have something to do with the body's ability to recover uh, after injury. So um, they don't say a whole lot about that, but it's, it's really interesting and it's a predictable response. So I think it's important that as we are applying cupping, we apply it where it makes the most sense, where there are patients who have pain, where they have a restriction of range of motion, where they have this perception that they're not able to do things. So if you apply cupping in those cases, you will tend to get the results that, um, that will make the patient happy. Uh, in all other things, really cupping is hit and miss. Um, I think practitioners need to be critical think thinkers about their explanations of how and why cupping works. Again, I think it's easier to impart information in Western physiology to the current patient, the patient who's coming in, who has been trained in Western medicine since they were born. And again, it's Western physiology. We learned how the organs work. I mean, start, I know I started in grade six or grade seven, um, and it's all based on Western physiology. So I think it's really important that we speak in that language to our clients so as not to confuse them. And really, if you do cupping, I commend you. Keep up the good work. If you have not tried it, either as a practitioner or a patient or a client, you know, go get cupping and see, if, see how it works for you. Um, if you're not doing it within your clinic, go take a cupping course so that you can see and join in because I think it's a valuable modality that you can use within your client, within your treatment room. It's just one more tool that's really easy to apply um, to help our clients get to their treatment goals. All right. Danelle, I think that's about all I've got for us. Is there uh, anything okay. else you want to know? Yes, we had some chats come in. So let's uh, take a look at this. Okay, um, let me stop this share so that we can see okay. each other talking. Great. Uh, Tiffany had asked how many, how much training would you recommend for a massage therapist to have other than the dabble we get in school right. if we got any introduction? Right. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say a weekend course is probably long enough to you, for you to get the idea. So somewhere in the 12 to 16 hour range. Um, I know for us, our introductory course is 12 hours. Or pardon me, our introductory course is 16 hours. <laughs> so, so I think that's a good minimum. That'll get you to the point of being comfortable applying it and um, being able to go in, take the weekend course, and then go in on Monday or whatever day is the next day you treat and fairly comfortably start applying it. Yeah, no problem. All right. I, um, there was another question from Susan. Can cupping on old burn tissue from down the road help? And is there a, recommend, a recommended oil or cream to use with cupping on burn tissue to help reduce any pain? So I'm going to throw out there the, the blanket statement of it depends. Um, now I'm saying that I have worked with burn patients um, and there's almost always a place where you can apply cupping, um, especially on old stuff. Um, you're going to have to apply it fairly regularly to make a difference because the difference is going to show up over time. Um, so regular treatment. So if, you're, if you're, your burn survivor is coming in 
and uh, getting treatment anyway, I would absolutely, unless they're on some medication that's um, an anticoagulant or something like that, or some medication that would contraindicate you doing cupping, I would absolutely do it. Um, they're in Australia. They, there's a group of physical therapists that do it quite frequently. Uh, and they use almost always use uh, massage cupping to do it. Um, I have found that I tend to use uh, more static cupping with the client moving, and I find it works a little bit better. But I don't do the other ones very often. So most of my burn survivors, uh, I get them earlier. I don't get a lot of the old ones that you're talking about. So mine are coming in with open lesions. So I don't want to apply oil because I don't want it to spread into an open lesion. So I'm applying more static cupping. So there's a reason why I'm doing that, right? Um, so I choose that particular kind of treatment specifically because of the clients I work on. Does that make All sense? Right. Thank you. We have some more, um, Paul. Excellent. <laughs> I, um, what research would you do for cupping and modern massage techniques? Uh, for example, lymphatic massage to remove cupping bruises. It's an interesting question. There are exactly two studies on cupping and lymphatic drainage. Um, so that I have found um, that makes sense. So um, there, <laughs> you could read both studies and then you'd be up to, uh, up to, up to snuff on that. Um, there really aren't a whole lot of studies in cupping that compare doing one technique to another technique of cupping. So because there just isn't enough studies in general. So um, when you're talking about re when you're talking about reading the research, it's really important to kind of gather all of the available primary research that you can read through it, understand it, and then see if the style of treatment that they used in studies that are like considered a good study, um, to see if that is mimicked or mimicking a modern massage technique. All right, um, Claudia is in Arizona. Yeah. And massage therapy insurance doesn't cover fi fire cupping, which makes it hard to find people to work on. So I have been using silicone cups or vacuum cups with a handle, being that you perform Eastern and Western, which works better for you? Or do you like working? Or what, I guess, what do you like working with? Yeah. So. I haven't done any fire cupping in probably six or seven years. So again, I don't think, let me put it this way. All cupping is the same. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, you can get higher suctions with the vacuum cups than you can get with any other style. It is easier to use silicone cups than vacuum cups. And glass cups are really fancy. And I mean, they have a really good theatric to them because there's fire. The problem here is because they're all just tools, um, they aren't all good at the same things. Um, if you open up my toolbox out in my garage, there are screwdrivers and hammers and there's a power drill and chisels and all sorts of fun things. And you can't use tools for not for things that they don't do well. So depending on how you practice, um, you will be drawn probably towards one type of cup more so than the other. Now, the fire cups come with a risk of harm that aren't isn't there 
with both plastic and silicone, which is the risk of burning a patient. I do not think that glass cups, fire cups, do anything so special that you couldn't just put them away and use silicone or um, the, the vacuum cups. So in my own practice, I will grab a silicone cup first, most of the time, unless I am doing something outrageously strong uh, and then I'll use a vacuum cup. Or if I want to use the hard edge of a vacuum cup to cross fiber tissue or something, uh, because that's the tool that does that the best. So I think if you're thinking of, do I buy silicone or do I buy vacuum? I think the answer is you buy both and you use the right tool for the right job. Okay. Um, Richard has asked, um... Silicon versus glass, what do you find clients prefer? Uh, equally, they'll, one group will prefer one versus the other. Whoops. I just scrolled down. Let's oh. see. <laughs> um, Tiffany, could we get links to your favorite research articles? I am an instructor, and my students will be doing research this semester on many different modalities. Absolutely. So, Paul, maybe you could, um, if you have an answer to this, email it to me and I'll include it in the follow-up email tomorrow. Sure. The, and then the that goes easiest, out to everyone. Yeah, the easiest way to find it, to be completely honest, I'll, I'll, I will give it to you, Danelle. Um, okay. But the really, the easiest, go to our website, cupincanada.com. I have a blog post with <laughs> links to all the research articles that we use in our course. Okay. So, it hasn't been updated in about three years. So there's been some new stuff that I've started to include, but I haven't updated that page yet. Um, I should put that on my to-do list, but it will get you started real quick. Okay, and I'll include the website in the follow-up email with the recording link and, and the PowerPoint. Great. Oh my goodness, the questions are coming. I took your EICC course last spring and use it all the time in my practice with confidence. Cupping often provides quicker results. Um, I'm laughing because I scrolled too fast. Quicker oh, results and certainly takes away some of the physical demands of the therapist's body for the same outcome. Thank you. And let's see what You're we welcome, have man. here. Another thank you for the information. I have never tried cupping. This is M. Murphy, I have never tried cupping. However, this presentation inspires me to try it. Thank you for all the information and thank you for the great questions. And Cindy, I use silicone cups at times or glass vacuum cups. So much better and more smooth than plastic cups. I share with clients that they can purchase silicone cups, cups and safely use them at home. I have found that fractionated coconut oil works well, unless your client is allergic. Some people love the massage gels for cupping. Yeah, All the right. question you, in that uh, is one I didn't answer with the burn one is what right. oil or what cream that I use. Um, anything that's slippery that doesn't soak in. All right. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Uh, what what which jojoba comes to my mind? I believe. Sure, uh, I use bio like so plug. I use biotone advanced therapy gel for a million years. All right, that's mm -hmm. good to know. Mm -hmm. What was your path into cupping as part of your manual therapy? Which technique, training, or research resources did you pursue pursue first? And is there a best path forward? Does one have to become licensed or only certified to be able to use it as a practitioner? Okay, my path in is the wonky one. Um, so I have been an athlete my entire life and I've been injured more times than I can count. Uh, while I was a massage therapist in my first couple of years of practice, um, I injured myself doing what, whatever sport it was. I don't even remember, probably karate. And my 
at my office, there was a TCM practitioner and she did cupping to me for the first time that I had it done. Um, she used a combination of fire cups and plastic vacuum cups. A uh, little bit later on in life, I a few years later, actually, I started taking courses in traditional Chinese medicine. And so um, when I formally went to school, um, we started taking training in cupping, but I'd already taken training in cupping from the woman who originally taught me or originally performed it on me uh, enough that at that point, 27 years ago, the licensing and stuff was really wonky. Um, so you could pretty much do anything at any time and your liability insurance would cover you. It's not so much anymore. Um, does one have to become licensed or only certified? There is no such thing as a certification in cupping. Um, there are companies that do say they offer a certification, but what they're giving you is a certificate and saying you're fine. However, mm -hmm. that doesn't give you any liability insurance. As a, If you're going to practice it professionally, it has to be a course, whatever course you take, that will allow you to um, do cupping within the confines of your existing license, whether that's massage therapist, athletic trainer, athletic therapist, physical therapist, whatever manual therapist you are. Um, if you are not one of those things, only do cupping on your family and friends. Okay. And we have, and I'm sure I'll mispronounce the name, Norg Young, registered for your course in Edmonton, and not only is looking forward to it, but wondering, is there advanced training as well? Yes. Our 16-hour training uh, is the one you're signed up for. Um, that will make you really tired because um, I talk this much the <laughs> for 16 hours. Even while you're practicing, I keep, keep talking. Um, so I will have your brain quite full. But after that, we have more advanced stuff. We have a specialized area where we do 12 hours on the head, face, and neck. Um, which is more advanced. And then we also have just started doing a cupping for lymphatics, cupping for lymphatic drainage. And that's actually, we're just launching it in February. So um, there's that one as well, if you're interested in that. And that information can be found on your website. Correct. All right. Well, a lot of praise and thank yous have come in through the chats. And in wrapping up, um, before I give you a, a, another chance, Paul, I'm going to just quickly um, remind folks that tomorrow there will be a follow-up email. It will include the recording link and a copy of tonight's PowerPoint. And it will um, also have contact information for Paul and how you can continue to be in touch with him. In February, we have... I'm forgetting January already. In January, we have Stephanie Lynn Hall doing um, reflexology for pain and stress, and that will be January 24th. In February, we have Ann Williams, February 7th, putting therapy back in aromatherapy. And February 21st, we have Janet Wolf Levins with acupressure for grief and lung and large intestine channels. Um, so watch your in basket for future invitations to edu talks. And with tomorrow's email, if you do not see it by the afternoon, please check your junk mail. And lastly, Paul, um, anything else you'd like to add before we wrap this up this evening? Yeah, can I plug a few upcoming things or throw up my... Uh, um email address and stuff like that? You can, but I see another chat. What is the prere oh. prerequisite for the LDT and cupping course? The prerequisite is that you've taken another cupping course, a basic level one. We have to have people, I can't teach you cupping and lymphatic drainage at the same time. It, you have to have taken a cupping course before. Our preference is that you take our 16-hour program. 
And that way your language is going to be correct and I don't have to correct anything uh, so that you can we can focus on um, the lymphatic drainage at that point. All right, and that's nice. going to be a 16 chat. hour program. <laughs> All right. And again, on your website is more information about that. I did see Cindy had an, one last comment question. Uh, your massage law for your state and or area may have education requirements to use cupping. We have a minimum requirement where I am located. If completed in mass if completed in massage school, the school has to specify the hours to fulfill the requirement, or it can be met with CE. Yep. So thank you. Thank you, Cindy, for adding that. And mahalo nui loa from Hawaii. Yes. And would love to come to Canada to take one of your courses. Don, just, so, bring, us, just bring us to Hawaii. Yes. Um, Paul. Yes. Your email address, your contact information, your plugs, and then we'll need to wrap it up for this oh, evening. All right. Let me flip back to this because I will have it all written out here on my next one here. My email address is paul at cupincanada.com. And that will be in the email follow-up as well tomorrow. Yeah. And, and then and here's how to find us and all of the other stuff. Wonderful. And that will be in the follow-up um, PowerPoint presentation Absolutely. Um, with the email tomorrow. Absolutely. And lastly, you're doing, you are presenting. Yes. So coming up, we are in Wisconsin for the AMTA conference in January 20th to the 22nd. We've got an online course called Evidence-Informed Clinical Cupping from the 28th and 29th. Uh, someone said we we're in El in Edmonton, so we're going to see you there. The cupping for lymphatics will be online February 25th and 26th. These are all live courses online or in person. And in April, we'll be doing our next iteration of the 60-minute series, which is very similar to what we're doing tonight, um, where we have a five nights in a row of uh, single one-hour courses. So... Uh, it'll be awesome. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, did you close out? Um, did you close out your PowerPoint? I did. You did. Okay. Um, I can put it I, back up if you want. Um, Nicholas Knight was asking um, for the contact information. There That's it is. great. That's great. So, and, and again, this information, Paul's entire uh, PowerPoint will be in the follow-up email tomorrow. Absolutely. All the good stuff. Thank you so much, Paul. This was wonderful. Um, the audience enjoyed as well and is very thankful and good luck to you. Thank you. And there's one, one more thing I'd like to mention. Um, the lymphatic drainage and cupping presentation this week, oh, January right. 12th. Yes. That, that you'll be doing, and that's open to everyone. Right. Um, it is, uh, we're doing it in, uh, it's called In Session with the uh, Massage Magazine Insurance Plus. Um, it is a free lecture. Uh, it'll be one hour, I believe it's in the middle of the afternoon, two or three o'clock or something. Um, I yeah, I'm in presentations all week, so I'm a little confused as to which ones I'm doing when. So thanks for that, Donnell. All right. Well, I think it would benefit everyone to know about the additional information they can learn on cupping Absolutely. and and the lymphatic system. Thank you, everyone. Please join us again January 24th for re reflexology for pain and stress with Stephanie Lynn Hall. And thank you so much. Have a wonderful 2023. And we'll see you again. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Paul. Cheers.